wasn't really my intention, Mr. Speaker, to delve in any kind of detail or even superficially into the appointment of the Deputy Speaker, but certainly a hope, Mr. Speaker, given that the member from Castries South has opened up the box, the Pandora's box, you will allow me to respond in some kind of detail, Mr. Speaker. The member, oh, all of a sudden there's a motion. When you went on your journey. Member, when a member responds to what you say, why you responded there's only one chair? And then you're going to say your time is up. Thank you very much for your advice, Mr. Speaker. Always very much appreciated. So, Mr. Speaker, on the situation with the Deputy Speaker, and members want to, how did we arrive at this position? Members on the opposite side, Mr. Speaker, when they were in opposition for five years, made an allegation that there was a breach of the Constitution of because of their own interpretation of the act and many people around this table share that interpretation and that's 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 their privilege we all can interpret things of the constitution constitution is not necessarily mr speaker always a very easy document to understand the document the constitution was very clear about the deputy speaker it always envisaged always that the deputy speaker would come from a member who is in the house that means a member a, a member of parliament ought to be, had to be, the Deputy Speaker. Always. And the Constitution also makes a very clear clarification between government and opposition. That's why there's a government and there's an opposition. And when it speaks to the House, it speaks of the collective assembly of our Parliament, meaning both the opposition as well as the government. And in the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, it is very clear that when the House first meets, Mr. Speaker, when it first meets, Mr. Speaker, there has to be the first, the election of a Speaker, and the Speaker may come from either among the members of the House or a person who comes from outside the House and could be elected. That's the first order of business. The second order of the business of the House, Mr. Speaker, is that we must have a Deputy Speaker elected in order for the House to proceed. It is also very clear, Mr. Speaker, at any point for whatever circumstances that a Speaker vacates the position of the Speaker of the House, the House must have a Speaker before it reconvenes. It must. Cannot proceed without that. In the case of the Deputy Speaker, Mr. Speaker, what it says is that the House Excuse me, what it said before, before the amendment, before the amendment, Mr. Speaker, what it said was, is that you, the House, the House must elect a member from the House who does not hold the position either of a minister nor of a parliament secretary at its earliest convenience. It doesn't say that the House needs to proceed or needs a member uh, a speaker a deputy speaker to proceed now that is a member that is member for mikusov with all due respect you sought the latitude of the chair to respond to what the member for castree south said at no point in time in the castree's south mp's presentation did he proceed along the lines that you are going down what he spoke about was your anticipation of what would happen today. So I am always a student for learning. So as much as I appreciate your lecture on the Constitution, the member for Castries South never ventured down that path. So if you're going to seek my latitude, please respond to what he said. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, but I am getting to his question because he did say that um, we were surprised or ought not to have been surprised by the appointment of a member from the House and that, that um, our anticipation that somebody was going to come from outside the House, Mr. Speaker. I was giving the background to how we got there. So the fact is, Mr. Speaker, and let me hurry it up for everyone, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, is that after five years of crying rather than taking it to the courts, 
the government, when it came in, decided to fulfill a, a campaign promise, Mr. Speaker, and that it was going to amend the Constitution. And there were supposed to be two amendments to the Constitution, Mr. Speaker. One, one amendment, Mr. Speaker, was supposed to be that we must have a deputy speaker in the House. So it cannot be at its earliest convenience anymore. And that section of the Constitution was amended to say that if a deputy speaker resigned, we must immediately or no later than the next House sitting elect a new deputy speaker. And that's fine. The problem, though, was the second amendment they were supposed to make, Mr. Speaker, was to say that the deputy speaker must come from the government side. Okay? But you see, they didn't do that, Mr. Speaker. Although that's what they had been advocating all along. Instead, what did they do? They said that the deputy speaker can come from either within the House, one of its members who was not a cabinet called member or a parliamentary secretary, or somebody from outside. So how can members on the opposite side want to sit here for any moment and convince anyone in St. Lucia that, that there was never a contemplation on their side of possibly bringing in a deputy speaker from outside the House? Uh, member, I, 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 can, I can't allow you to prolong that. The, the Prime Minister made it abundantly clear up to this morning. He never said members of his side contemplated or did not contemplate. What he said was clear and unambiguous, that he never made a statement that the deputy speaker would come from outside the house. That is what the prime minister said. So you are now bringing a new element about whether the government contemplated bringing a deputy speaker. Clearly, if an amendment is made where it allows for a deputy speaker from outside, it does mean that the government would contemplate at some point in time. But today, the Prime Minister made it, if I may borrow a phrase from the late Forbes Burnham, pellucidly clear that he never said, not that he never contemplated, but he never said that he intended to bring a deputy speaker from outside. So. You've made your point, I think you can move on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, but it, it is important to say that they created the option of either having the person appointed. And there were several press conferences and public pronouncements by the government and the Prime Minister included, in which many people would have interpreted that the intention was to bring somebody from the other. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there was even, there was even um, rumors as to who those persons would be. But I move on, Mr. Speaker. The fact, the fact, Mr. Speaker, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, as the leader of the opposition, I had to take it, my job, very seriously. And to remind the government that even though they may have made that amendment to that section, Mr. Speaker, that it's still required for section 30 to be amended. Because it's, it's interesting, you know, Mr. Speaker, the framers of the Constitution give the latitude the latitude, Mr. Speaker, for Parliament to amend the Constitution by themselves. But there are special sections within the Constitution, Mr. Speaker, in which the framers of the Constitution make it very clear that the parliamentarians by themselves, even with a two-thirds majority, cannot make those amendments by themselves. It must include the approval of the people, which is through a referendum. And so, Mr. Speaker, next week we are about to approve what should be something very simple, which is the estimates. And in proving the estimates, a lot of people may not have realized that. The estimates are not approved at the end of the debate. The estimates are approved once they are laid in the House. And, and it is required, Mr. Speaker, a very important part of our constitutional process that in order for the government to pay salaries on April 1st, in order for government to pay debt or to pay any of the operating costs, the estimates must be approved before March 31st. If they are not, 
then we would be in the breach of the Financial Act. And if, in fact, Mr. Speaker, the government had taken up its option, of which it had alluded to, and come to the House and attempted to have approved the Deputy Speaker from outside the House, it would have been our responsibility to have pointed out the illegality of that process. So, Mr. Speaker, the members from the opposition are, in fact, very pleased and happy to see that the government decided not to put the Constitution to test and have not decided to make a to place our finances of this country in a quagmire and have done the reasonable thing of choosing and who you wanted to choose on your side as long as they were not a minister or not a parliamentary sector, we can proceed. So Mr. Speaker, I move on now to the tourism thing. Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I am extremely pleased by not only the member from Castries South in his recent pronouncements, but also for the majority of the members on the opposite side of the government side of their new discovery of the importance of tourism. And I welcome, honestly, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the fact now that we don't have to get into this nonsensical debate about tourism and racism, subservience, etc. That we have to now start understanding the importance of foreign direct investment, Mr. Speaker and that we're not going to demonize tourism, we're not going to demonize foreign direct investment, and in fact, we are now going to be able to create an environment to support the growth of tourism. And the fact is, is that the difference between the two political parties at this point on tourism, Mr. Speaker, is how to do that, but not anymore whether we should do that. Because it has been very questionable by the actions and the policies and the statements made publicly by some of the members of government as to whether they really, truly, genuinely appreciate it. I mean, even the, the member from Castries East, in his pronouncement that all of a sudden, he now didn't know that, understand tourism, and he now understands the importance of tourism. I, I don't criticize him for that. I welcome that we finally have gotten to that threshold where both sides now can agree. So, Mr. Speaker, all of a sudden now, sandals and, and, and all-inclusive and whether it's negative against the country. I see now there's a new love affair and a new embracing of sandals as to how great they are and the contribution they're not only making in St. Lucia but throughout the region. So I say to the members on the opposite side, thank you, finally, that you've reached up to us and we can now celebrate Butch Stewart, a great, a great individual who we should all be very proud of as a West Indian man, as to building a brand in the Caribbean that is globally competitive. And the thousands of jobs and the millions of millions of dollars that he's invested into this region. I am glad now that the members on the opposite side have embraced that. I am so happy, Mr. Speaker, and even more happy for the people at Cabot that the members on the opposite side now have recognized that this is a world-class investment and this is going to make a significant economic contribution to the country. And I've understood that it's not just about a hotel, it's not just about a golf course, but it's about real estate development and the jobs that are going to be generated and preparing our workforce to be able to not only take up those jobs, but to do them at a world-class level because the Cabot, Mr. Speaker, has been ranked number 75 in the world already. And projections are that it will make it into the top 20. I want to remind us in this house, Mr. Speaker, only one other golf course in the entire Caribbean has made it into the 100 rank. And that is in the Dominican Republic. And it was ranked number 74 this year. Cabot is one behind it in its first year. And I'm just so glad to see members going to Cabot, participating in the opening, and finally, Mr. Speaker, publicly embracing Cabot and the investors of Cabot. That is a good sign. Mr. Speaker, it is good to see the embracing of Merritt Courtyard, because I know that there was a hesitation on some of the members on the opposite side, whether we should be putting a hotel near Point Seraphim. I am so happy, and you all are welcome, that when you all came in, that the project had already been signed, financing, negotiating, and work had already begun. I am so happy, Mr. Speaker, that we don't have to be in a point of contention anymore as to whether that was a good investment or not. That was good. That was started by us. We celebrate the fact that you've now embraced it and you're continuing it. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm so sorry that my, mem my friend from mem uh, member of uh, Cast 3 Central is not here. He has repeatedly, and I, I believe I didn't hear him today, but I'm pretty sure it's one of his top 10 list of things he loves to talk about, is the acquisition of the land at Mont Piedmont, Mr. Speaker. Both the uh, land was acquired at Mont Piedmont, as well as the land at Shock. And I dare say, the land that Galaxy is being built on was also acquired back after the, the, the 2008-2009 financial crisis, Mr. Speaker. So guess what? When we came into government, we found out that both Shock and Mont Piedmont were still in receivership. And we knew that even if we identified an investor, there were plenty of hurdles that would have to be overcome. So the government acquired the lands for $11 million through Invest in Lucia. So Invest in Lucia purchased the lands from the, the receiver um, in the UK and got terms for the financing. The, Landed Shock was sold for, I think it's just either under or above $6 million. And then the lands recently, based on what I've seen in public announcements with Mont Piedmont, was sold for $15 million. So that means that the two properties that were owned by Invest in Lucia that were acquired by our government for $11 million was actually now sold for $21 million. That means Invest in Lucia, when it gets paid, would have actually made a profit of $11 million. But more importantly, because Invest owned it, Invest had the ability of being able to, to control the narrative of those investors in terms of what they're gonna be. So I am happy, I am happy that, the, that, the, that the, the, my government was able to do that. I'm even happier now that there is no argument by members on the opposite side as to how brilliant of a decision that was and to embrace that as a positive move and to grow on that. Mr. Speaker, Galaxy. Again, Galaxy was sold the land under the CIP program. And Galaxy is building three hotels in that location. And I'm so happy to see that members on the opposite side traveling to Dubai, getting them to sponsor all kinds of things and how embracive they are to that project and how in encouraging the news is of the progress of that particular project. And to see that the members on the other side finally now believe in that project. Because initially there was a lot of, of gloom, doom and gloom, but I am so happy, Mr. Speaker, to hear members on the opposite, especially the CIP program, encouraged by what's taking place there and the development is taking place in the South and the impact it's going to have. Sabasha, Mr. Speaker, again, I'm happy to hear that when the government came in, that they continued. And even though there was some misunderstandings in the initial part, and I understand that, thinking that, thinking that the Bulgarians that are at Sabasha were the Bulgarians that they left there to now find out that they're two separate companies. And again, I want to be able to, to, to thank the Bulgarians that are doing Merit Courtyard that when they realized the difficulties they were having with that project, they found a new investor. And I'm very grateful that the government has continued to do the work. These things take time. I know you're getting the road fixed up, and I know the displacement of some of the residents there is being worked on. I want to congratulate you. But it's because of your new understanding of tourism and the impact it's going to have on solutions that I see this new renewed effort on your part to make these things happen. I am very happy. Mr. Speaker, I hope now that members on the opposite side would have realized when they went to Coconut Bay that there's two hotels in Coconut Bay. There's the old Coconut Bay and there's Serenity. And the impact of a high-end property in Coconut Bay and in terms of the employment it's generated and the economic activity it's generated. And again, I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure I know they will because of their renewed understanding of tourism, that when the expansion plans come to expand both Serenity and even Coconut Bay, that I know that members on the opposite side will embrace that and facilitate it so they can happen as quickly as possible. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, Village Tourism. Despite, again, the members wanting to change the name, that's come commonplace with the members on the opposite side. I want to encourage them to really understand the detail behind the Village Tourism. If we are going to have more solutions, and that's what we want, we want to see that the expansion of tourism, Mr. Speaker, that more St. Lucians are given that opportunity. And it's very difficult when you have a small property, Mr. Speaker, to make the infrastructural investments by yourself. 
I mean, I went through that personally with Coco Creole, which was originally 12 rooms. It is virtually impossible to make a decent return on that size problem. This is why it was hurtful, Mr. Speaker. You have to be honest with you. When members of the opposite side wanted to play, and I, let, me, let me restrain from using that adjective, play cheap politics in the sense that roads, you, you, you can't eat roads. The roads up to your area in uh, Saltibus. How many people, and we know that my business at their homes do Airbnb, and who are now so grateful for the fact that it makes it easier to be able to sell those properties. Roads in Grosele, Kasimba, that all of a sudden, well, I wish, Foston Hills is a story for you, okay? I'll be happy to touch it. But again, the roads are no longer just about making it comfortable for us to drive. It's to open up more opportunities. And that's again, Mr. Speaker, there's two aspects to village tourism that I have said and I want to be able to reiterate, Mr. Speaker. One is, is to be an incubator, to be able to provide um, access to these small hotels or restaurants, to software, to interior decoration, um, to financial support, and also to make it even better for the banks, Mr. Speaker. That when the banks now are lending monies to these small businesses, the banks know that there's somebody they can go to. Because there's somebody holding that, um, that investor's hand. And many of our banks, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that tourism is such a big part of our economy, they themselves have lacked the appropriate skills, Mr. Speaker, to assess tourism properly and to be able to provide that support. So village tourism was to be an incubator to help people who want to get into the industry, whether it's by way of an attraction, whether it's by way of an Airbnb, whether it's in, by way of having um, uh, a small uh, room, whether it's by having a restaurant, whether it's by having um, a, an art shop and a gift shop, but facilitating them through an incubator with all the professional skills that they would need. The second component of Village Tourism, Mr. Speaker, which is very important, is the infrastructure. So when you go down the, to an ancillary or you go down to a Canaries or you go to a Souffrere, that all of the villas and Airbnbs that are on the exterior, the reception of the hotel becomes the village. That there's restaurants, shops, and activity that they can participate in. That is what generates the character. That is what's going to differentiate St. Lucia by authentic tourism. The big hotels play their important part, Mr. Speaker, because they drive volume, and that is necessary. But it's going to be impossible for St. Lucians themselves to build a Sandals, to build um, a St. James Hotel. I'm hoping that one day it will not be impossible. But for now, there are not many St. Lucians who have the financial or wherewith at all to build a hotel of that size. So in the meanwhile, what are we going to do to help them get into the industry. So I want to say, Mr. Speaker, that conceptually, this idea of this fund is a very good thing. Again, when I go back to the act that was passed and the absence of the regulations, the teeth of the matter, the details of the matter, there's one thing that is in this um, proposal that concerns me a little bit. Who is going to determine what the excess amount of money from the levy is going to be? Because it was really my understanding, Mr. Speaker, that when we put the levy together, the levy was to be used for marketing. Why? Because the hotels are already paying taxes at the airport. The customer comes in, they pay $98. All of the electricity cost. And when, even when they're bringing in food and they're bringing in their operating materials, they pay duties on that. That's not duty free. The hotels and the tourism sector is already paying a significant amount of money to the taxes. And the purpose of this was really to put the money in and having it related to the performance. What do I mean by that, Mr. Speaker? I'm hoping in their new exuberance of tourism that members on the opposite side will also appreciate that marketing 
is not a cost. Marketing is an investment. And the investment that you make with marketing is branding. And branding is what drives value. If you take a, a three-star hotel in St. Lucia, it's probably going to get an average of $120 to $150 rate per night. That same hotel in Barbados gets $200 and something dollars. That same hotel in Cayman gets over $600 a night. And that is what? The branding of the destination. It is the marketing of the destination that creates now added value. And that added value is very important because the operating costs in St. Lucia are so high. So Mr. Speaker, I would just like to say to the government, my little advice, if in fact you're going to use this where you're going to make a discretion, a discretionary decision as to how much the levy is going to be and how much of that percentage of that levy is going to remain in the fund, the, the marketing fund, the, the tourism, what is it called, the tourism authority, who is going to make that decision? This does not say that. It only says it's possible. But nowhere does it describe what the overflow is. I can only assume it is an excess amount that you determine. Because it's for the government or the, tourism, the, tour, the Ministry of Tourism to determine how much the levy is going to be in the first place. So I assume it's the same persons that are going to say, well, three quarters of the levy is going to remain in the tourism authority and one third is going to go into this. And I would hope to think that that's not the case. It has always been the belief that the extra revenue we're generating in tourism, the monies that we're gonna get from donor countries, etc., that that money would be used to help improve the infrastructure of tourism, not at the expense of marketing, Mr. Speaker. And I say this because we are now having a better conversation. Because we no longer have to have a discussion as to whether tourism is a good thing. We now know that. We're now getting into the details and I'm going to say to all of us, it is important that we understand the marketing and branding in differentiating our product to drive the airlift and to drive the rates. Because with a proper brand, people are willing to pay more. And that more is absolutely necessary because the cost of electricity is too high here. And as the, as the Prime Minister said, the member from uh, Castries East said, hard to control that, I'm importing that. Cost of bringing containers in, expensive. Local transportation is high. We don't have the economies of scale. So the discussion that has to take place, Mr. Speaker, very importantly, is a plan for tourism. Where are we going? How many rooms do we want? And is that scientifically worked out in terms of our own competitiveness? Because it becomes back to our competitiveness. What are we doing to train our workers? What are we doing to train our service providers to go into the sectors of tourism that we want? Because tourism is not one thing in itself. There's romance, there's family, there's business, there's all kinds of tourism products and all have different needs. So Mr. Speaker, let me reiterate my position again. I am very happy, and we should all be, that both political parties now are going to embrace tourism. Both political parties now are going to talk no longer about demonizing foreign direct investors, no longer demonizing and, and being racist with the type of tourists that come to St. Lucia, but more importantly, that this, this nonsensical argument, that this rhetorical question that is asked all the time, how many rooms did you build? So again, Sandals, Cabot, Marriott Courtyard, Mount Pleasant, Mont, Mont Piedmont, sorry, and Shock, Galaxy, um, Sabusha, Serenity, just to name a few that we were involved in in the last administration. Oh, we laugh. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, you know, it's amazing to me how bold and which one? Okay, great. Congratulations. End of the day, we need all hands on deck. So I'm hoping that the members on the opposite side will continue with their new discovery of tourism and stop politicizing it and realize that we all need to be on the same page. The differences will come in terms of branding. The differences may come in the number of rooms, okay? 
But the fact is, let us agree that we have to move the needle forward and stop trying to make cheap political points at the expense of an industry that the member from Castries South now has admitted that it's resilient. It's withstood the test of times. It helps distribute income to all kinds. There are a whole bunch of people now that he's relies that depend on tourism and that can continue to go. I'm so happy. Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm not even going to get into that, Mr. Speaker. I, I've made my point, Mr. Speaker. I thank you again for your opportunity for me to expand on the Deputy Speaker issue, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I look forward to this new relationship that we both political parties have as it pertains to tourism. And I look forward that we can work in, coll in collusion to make sure that St. Lucia is the best destination in the world and that the most number of St. Lucians are benefiting from it and that we can earn a satisfactory income to propel our country forward. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me, let me say a few. Let me say a few.